The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, July 3rd, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live. Right. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown to Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, we are playing a reprise of an interview we did back in February. I think it was February 19th of 2018 with Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, as you know, And let's bring Emma in here. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg passed away uh, just about two or three weeks ago. Um, And uh, I wanted to uh, play two interviews with Daniel Ellsberg. The one that we did in, um, in, in February of 2018 about his book, The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner, which is fascinating. Um, But also the first interview that, I had ever done with Daniel Ellsberg with Janine Garofalo. He came in studio into uh, on the majority report on air America back in, I think it was 2004 or five and I've not been able to find it. Um, if you happen to know when the date is, let us know. Um, but he, I thought I maybe already clipped that for a best of before. I feel like we did at one point, but I'm not sure. And, um, the, I mean, I don't even remember what we talked about necessarily at that time. I remember afterwards we went out for a drink, like with a couple other people at Air America and and, and Janine and Daniel Ellsberg, and he he was doing magic. Yeah, you told me this. I forget if it was on air. That's I've already now told this anecdote to a few people because it's just it's uh it was completely not what I expected. It's not what you expect. He was the most sort of like gentle um sort of gregarious um guy and when you contemplate what he did the amount of bravery and when you hear this story um it is about how he also had other information that he had basically that he felt needed to be released he was a he was an economist he worked for the rand uh um uh, Corporation. corporation Uh, and was a uh, military analyst and, you know, saw what the U.S. government was doing and particularly, obviously, the Pentagon Papers. Um, But so much uh, bravery uh, in terms of doing what he felt was right. And this story is is nuts. This is the last book, I think, that he wrote. Um, And uh, it is, uh, I wanted to replay this and he just passed away. Um, and we will keep looking for that original, uh, interview that we did back in the day and, and maybe we'll put that out for members. But, uh, in the meantime, uh, enjoy this interview. And just to, to, for people who might not have been familiar with Daniel Ellsberg before, it's just really important to understand his story. If you're trying to understand Edward Snowden, if you're trying to understand, uh, Chelsea Manning, reality winner, um assange. assange honestly i mean, I mean we've get, had... look at how we're we're uh <laughs> attempting to continue to prosecute assange versus how uh ellsberg is rightly now being treated as as like the hero that he is it's yeah a and there's a lot of talk about but... this sort of thing now like it's fashionable to be i mean elon musk considers himself a whistleblower um but we have like we've done two clips with uh um ellsberg specifically about the assange case and him warning about the dangers of that and those only get like eight thousand views and it's depressing to me yeah Yeah. um but uh this is a, a, a a fascinating interview from a guy who was a genuine hero and uh really uh took a a tremendous amount of risk at a time where there really wasn't like 
there was no support structure set up for something like this. And, and you know, um, and so uh, we're playing this and then uh, no show tomorrow. It is July 4th. Uh, take a day off, folks. And then on fr on Wednesday, we will have uh, no live show. There's no live show today. Um, on Wednesday, we're going to have a uh, reconstruction, right? Uh, we're going to be talking about... Um, I was debating about, like, replaying that interview that we did with, with, with Blight uh, about uh, um, uh, Frederick Douglass because of his um, sort of, like, it's not my 4th of July type of situation or our uh. 4th of July. But... Uh, this was also another great one that we had never had an opportunity to replay. So, uh, enjoy this February 19th, 2018, right after this word from our sponsor. And we'll be back on Wednesday with a, uh, another repeat, but back live on, uh, Thursday. Thursday. It is a pleasure to welcome, uh, to the program, Daniel Ellsberg. Um, he, of course, is, um, I hope, uh, well known to uh, folks uh, for releasing the Pentagon Papers, uh, but he is also uh, uh, has just released a, a new book on, uh, on the Doomsday Machine. Welcome to the program, Daniel. Very glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay, so the Doomsday Machine is um, uh, Confessions of a, a Nuclear War uh, Planner, uh, discusses your time as that, as a, as a nuclear war planner. And let's start off with the intention that you had of not just releasing the Pentagon Papers, but while you were uh, preparing to release those, uh, you were also intending to release uh, papers concerning our nuclear war preparation. Yes, I had a lot of notes from my years working on the command and control of nuclear weapons and nuclear war plans uh, in the late 50s and early 60s. And then I moved over to working on Vietnam in 64. <clears throat> but in 1969, when I copied the Pentagon Papers, I copied everything else in my top secret safe at that time and some other secret stuff uh, with the intention of putting that information out when the Pentagon Papers, the study of decision-making in Vietnam, had had as much effect as I could hope for it to have in shortening that war. Unfortunately, uh, I gave all those nuclear notes to my brother separately for safekeeping. He put them in a trash heap and dump in uh, Terrytown, buried in a bluff, and uh, a, a tropical storm, Doria, came across scattered the contents of that dump all over the place, and he was never able to recover the box with the nuclear papers in them. So to my very great disappointment, those were lost. And, and, and so um, what, let me ask you this, and I want to obviously get into what were in those, uh, those notes, and, but, but, but why, why write about it now? Uh, as opposed to, I mean, we're we're talking uh, forty some odd years uh, that those those papers or your intention to release those um, uh, papers. Well, as soon as the uh, as soon as the war ended, and I, I spent all my time really trying to help shorten the war, lobby against it, and do actions. And uh, my trial having ended in seventy three, and then the war went on for two more years. As soon as the war had ended, I really. Um, approached with a project, uh, my publisher at that time, in hopes of releasing at least the substance of all these documents, although I no longer had the documents. I did have some notes still that hadn't been lost with the others. And their feeling was that in 75, with the Vietnam War just over, there was zero interest in nuclear matters by the public, and uh, they wouldn't publish it. I turned my activities entirely to trying to help build an anti-nuclear movement that would be comparable in scale and perhaps effect to the anti-war movement. And I really spent the next 40 years mostly doing that. Interesting. And um, so, okay, so, so tell us, I mean, what was, what was your job as a nuclear war planner? And when was it that you first 
I mean, wh- when did the worm turn, I guess, uh, for you, like uh, I- in terms of nuclear war? Well, when I went to the Rand Corporation in 1958 for the summer and then permanently in 59, it was in the context of a supposed missile gap and the possibility of a Soviet surprise attack with their allegedly large number of missiles that would be able to uh, destroy our ability to retaliate. So I was trying to hold off nuclear war. Uh, My feelings against nuclear weapons were already very abhorrent, really, but deterrence seemed the only way of, uh, of avoiding or postponing a nuclear war. And that perception didn't change until late 61, when our secret reconnaissance satellites conveyed the fact that they had almost none of the weapons that had been estimated. Specifically, I had recently been out to SAC, Strategic Air Command Headquarters in Offutt Field, Omaha, and the head of SAC had been reported to believe that the Russians at that time, in August of 61, had a thousand intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, at a time when we had 40. In fact, a month later, the reconnaissance satellites revealed that what they had was four. So we had 10 times as many as they had. They had essentially none, uh, four at one base in Plesetsk. So our entire image of the uh, Hitler-like aggressive Soviet Union that was uh, spending every effort to take over the world and specifically destroy their great rival, the United States, was obviously wrong, totally wrong. But rather than rethinking that from uh, ground to top, uh, like other people, I really turned to the question of how could we turn this new superiority we just discovered to our advantage in the Berlin crisis of 1961. So uh, looking back, one of the things I have to confess is that I was one of the many, the everybody, who failed to see that this uh, was a time for changing our whole concept of what was possible in the way of negotiation, what was possible in the way of disarmament, and instead just pursuing the process. But you asked me earlier uh, what jobs I had. When I went to Rand uh, in 58 and then 59, I concentrated on presidential decision-making because as an economist, I'd focused on an abstract field called decision theory, making decisions when you don't know for sure the consequences of your actions. How do you act reasonably in those cases? So how would a president act reasonably if he got a warning such as we just had and and uh, a million people in Hawaii were just uh, treated with the warning that missiles were on their way? Uh, What should the president do if he got a warning like that? And assistance to presidents have gotten those warnings in the past very seriously. Like Hawaii, they were false alarms, and some of them had been human error on our part. Some were electronic error or mechanical error. But there had been erroneous uh, alarms before, some of which brought us very close to nuclear war, that is, to the end of the world. We've been very lucky that uh, that trigger has not been pulled yet in all these years, even though it's being threatened once again uh, by our present president. Anyway, I was looking at how to avoid that happening by mistake, as in those cases, and and uh, with my colleagues, how to assure that an execute order would go out appropriately uh, if we were under attack. And in that context, I worked for the Commander-in-Chief Pacific, Sink Pack, Admiral Harry Felt, at that time, went all over the Pacific to the various command posts, as I describe in my book, and uh, discovered some very uh, disconcerting things, such as the fact that the supposed two-man rule, where any dealing with nuclear weapons of sending out an alert message or a warning or an execute message had to be done by at least two different individuals, was always violated. Uh, In every command post, they had made arrangements where one person alone could do that. And another discovery, uh, was even more startling, was that uh, the president was not the only person authorized to send out uh, launch nuclear weapons. In case of outage of communication from Washington, something that happened part of every day in those days in the Pacific, 
uh, the commander in chief Pacific was authorized by Eisenhower to take it on himself to launch those weapons if he felt it was necessary. And he, in turn, had delegated it to others, like the 7th Fleet Commander and uh, Sink Pack Fleet and others. They had delegated, or at least allowed the impression to get further down to very low-level bases, that under uh, conditions of attack, if your communications were out, it was up to the local commander to decide whether to go ahead or not. Yeah. That was obviously a very dangerous situation. Something like that uh, exists today, and not only in the U.S., but in Russia and in, I'm sure, in North Korea as well. Okay, so uh, the, I want to go back. I want to. I want to. I want. want to touch again on that on that delegation. But I, I just want to uh, just touch uh, briefly again on the on the missile gap. So there is you, you, when you enter into um, uh, this field, there is a sense amongst uh, the U.S. government that there is a huge missile gap, uh, one which the United States is uh, lagging far far behind. Then uh, you get evidence. How widely disseminated was that evidence that, in fact, the missile gap was not, uh, the United States was not lagging to the extent that there was a missile gap. In fact, they were uh, way out ahead of Russia. You, you mentioned that this was a missed opportunity to, to reorient. But how, like, how, how much was there, how much of, of that belief of a missile gap was sort of... Um, was a delusion uh, that I presume would come out of fear? And how much was it sort of expedience to continue to build an arsenal? And, and, then, and then... That's a really uh, interesting question, and it's, it's not possible to answer that very definitively, uh, even now, I think. Um, I often wondered afterwards whether the high-level military had really known better all that time and were just making this stuff up. Uh, there was no question that people I was dealing with in the Air Force at the colonel or brigadier general level uh, did believe what they were hearing from superiors, from Air Force intelligence, that uh, there was all this. Uh, there was a dispute between the Air Force and the, and the Army intelligence at that time, where the Army started saying as early as 59, the missile gap kind of opened up in 58, uh, after a Russian... Soviet missile test in 57, which was earlier than we were able to do it. But by 58, the prediction that they would have hundreds going on thousands of weapons uh, began appearing. But by 59, the, Air Fo the Army and Navy together were skeptical of that. And ironically, the Rand Corporation, where I worked, where everyone, including the secretaries and the janitors, had to have top-secret clearance, uh, we're not getting the word that the Army and Navy were dissenting from this prediction because uh, as of, I think it was 59 or even 58, uh, Eisenhower made an order that uh, national intelligence estimates, NIEs, would not go to contractors like RAND. In those days, there weren't as many contractors as there are now. And now uh, a tremendous part of the intelligence process is done by contractors. But he cut them out at that point, and that meant that the RAND was left with estimates from their major patron, the Air Force. And the Air Force was the one that was making these very high estimates. So to this day, I'm not convinced entirely one way or the other whether the Air Force knew better, uh, but it was the case that the Army and Navy, looking at the same evidence, didn't believe it. And the Army and Navy could have been wrong, I have to say that. Uh, and I know that a lot of Air Force people did believe what they were saying, but I strongly suspect that there were others who felt who knew better and were just saying it in order to justify a large number of planes and bombers right. and missiles on our side. Right. I would imagine, I mean, there there is at least, at the very least, there's an opportunity when you're talking about the Air Force that... Um, at the very least, uh, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And um, yeah, the yeah. the notion of needing bombers and um, uh, as such um, uh, for... Well, to be very specific, you know, they had photographs from things like reconnaissance flights and some balloons that they sent over earlier. Then they had the early U-2 photographs. And the Air Force, it turned out in retrospect, had, perhaps sincerely, uh, interpreted 
church steeples. Of course, there's not a whole lot of church steeples still operating in uh, Soviet Union, as far as I know, but towers and church steeples and whatnot as missile sites or buildings as hiding missile sites. Well, how sincere was that? It's hard to say. They certainly were motivated in that mistake because they wanted there to be a lot of Russian missiles to justify our having a lot of missiles. And conversely, I do know that Air Force colonels sincerely regarded Army and Navy intelligence people as being virtually treasonous because they thought they just don't want there to be a lot of Russian missiles because they don't want us to have a lot of missiles. So I know that they were enraged by the Mm -hmm. estimates by the Army and Navy that actually turned out to be correct. And what? And and I guess just from uh, from from your your own personal perspective, because I assume that at least has some um, gives some indication. I mean, I guess intuitively, I would imagine that, or maybe not. Maybe you know, it's it's hard to put yourself in that situation. That if you felt that relief, right? I mean, if there was this fear that we're losing this missile gap, that they and that the there that's indicative of their intentions of uh, being extremely aggressive and, and perhaps imperialistic and whatnot, and then find out one day, like, oh, no, we have the story completely backwards. Um, what yeah. is it in... Well, well before, you know, I'm, I'm 86, and I've known for a long time that human and even more organizational perceptions and estimates and expectations are very strongly shaped by interests, by motives, by what you want to be the case or what you want to say. And it's very hard to escape from. At best, you can try to be conscious that this is always a factor and always operating and try to allow for it. But no human can totally allow for it. A lot of it is unconscious. And it affects everybody. I'm sure still me and everybody else. You can't entirely eliminate that. Okay, so um, so you you went forward with the notion of all right, how can we now that uh, we know that we're we're not losing this missile gap, how can we then um, uh, leverage this gap to uh, in our our geopolitics? At what point? I guess it was in 1961 that you saw this document as to what would happen. The the idea of like how one wins a nuclear uh, confrontation, or rather how it's impossible to win, that we're talking about annihilating yes. everybody. Talk, right. talk about that. Well, day. up to that point, uh, I saw these tremendous failings, it seemed like, like the, the unsupervised delegation or the violation of the two-man rule. And, by the way, uh, that last one is uh, kind of relevant right now because in Hawaii, they just instituted for the first time a two-man rule about sending out alerts instead of having one person do it and confirm it himself or herself. Of course, when I saw that, I took that with a grain of salt right. because uh, I knew that 40 years ago that rule was supposedly ironclad for sending out alert messages in our thing, and it was just always violated. So whether it, whether it'll be violated this time or not, probably yes, actually. Mm. Uh, it's just too inconvenient to follow those rules. Okay, on terms of uh, wanting, oh, the the revelation that you mentioned was, I drafted a question for the president to ask the Joint Chiefs of Staff for bureaucratic reasons. I thought it would make them uneasy and uh, in the sparring over whether to change the plans or not, for them to have to admit that they didn't know an answer to the question I drafted for the president, which was how many people would die if your plans were carried out, your JCS plans were carried out in general war that is against the USSR as planned. They didn't just all fail, they they weren't preempted, they, they got carried out the way they were planned. How many would die? And I actually thought that they had not made a calculation of that because my Air Force sources believed they had never seen one, and they didn't think the JCS had calculated that, and I was going to, in effect, embarrass them uh, by that and uh, soften them up for looking harder at their plans. Well, I was wrong, and my sources were wrong. They they did have an answer, and they came right back with it uh, unapologetically. And the answer came down to 600 million people, killing that we planned to kill 
600 million people if we carried out our plans, especially essentially in a first strike, in a preemptive strike, which was the preferred way of carrying of uh, carrying out a general war, and that included a hundred million of our allies, uh, not by hitting them with any warheads, but by the radioactive fallout from our attacks on East Europe, depending which way the wind blew, and of course East Europe itself was uh, the, supposedly, in those days, the captive nations under under um, the Soviet Union. They were indeed satellites that were reeled tyrannically as part of a Soviet empire. Then. And we were going to kill 100 million of those people by our attacks and by fallout, along with some 300 million or more in the USSR and China. And no matter how the war started, and Eisenhower had ruled that any armed conflict with the Soviet Union at any level, wherever, Iran, Yugoslavia, Berlin, anywhere, uh, would immediately lead to a all-out strike by the United States. But we would also hit China in that same event. And actually, when that was briefed, the Marine Commandant, uh, General Shoup, said that's not the American way to kill hundreds of millions of Chinese when it isn't even their fight. But it was the American plan, and it stayed that way. And I was determined to change those plans, but finding out that the Joint Chiefs actually did know or had an answer to uh, what their plans would do was very, very shocking to me. Uh, I thought that they were living in sort of denial and not thinking about it. But the idea that people were willing to contemplate killing more than half a billion people was uh, stunning. And I thought these are insane plans, and the people who have gone along with it, I knew they were very ordinary people and, uh, as good, good bureaucrats and colonels and staffers. And I knew them. I knew they were uh, drank beer with them. They were not monsters individually, but what they were planning was monstrous, and it was in the name of America. And it wasn't just a plan, it was a plan for using weapons actually on alert, as they are on alert to this day. Would they, I mean, when they did, when they would make these calculations, would they, or when they would express it, or when you would talk to people about it, was the feeling like, look, it's our responsibility. Well, I didn't talk to many people about this. I, this is a big secret. Right. Uh, I wasn't even supposed to see it. It was for the president's eyes only, and the reason it was shown to me was that I'd written the question. I drafted the question. So the president's assistant showed me something that I was headed for the president's eyes only. It well, so, wasn't something I could talk about. So do you people. think that, I mean, do you think that it was one of those things where uh, they like, well, we got to do these numbers, but this is, no, you know, we would never do this. You know, we have... We have a plan if... Uh... No, 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 no. That was, it was absolutely a fear. This is early 61, and the Air Force people in particular thought there was an imminent possibility that over Berlin or some other, next year it was Cuba, uh, we might have to carry out these plans. These were not thought of as just hypothetical academic plans of some sort. This was the operational planning for how to use the weapons actually on existence and on alert, deployed all over the world. Wow. Thousands of vehicles. Wow. And 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 so and and so let's let's talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis because uh, you know we're 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 working our way there from a from a historical standpoint. And you write that you felt that neither J or I should say uh, put it this way, that Khrushchev and JFK were more or less bluffing. Like neither one of them had the intention of actually pulling the metaphorical trigger, but that that the fact that they neither one of them had that intention, but they came so close was indicative of how these events sort of take on a life of their own and go beyond the ability of of the players to maybe stop it. Well, after 40 years of studying this crisis, in which I participated at the time and then studied with very high classified access the next year, I've most of what I know about it now has learned much since then, and some of it just this last year or two, because new information from the Russians keeps coming out and elsewhere. I now conclude, contrary to what I thought at the time, 
that neither Kennedy nor Khrushchev had any intention of carrying out the threats they were making. They were bluffing, and I believe they were determined not to come to armed conflict because of the fear that that would escalate. And yet, they were making deployments to make their threats credible and plausible, just as we're doing right now in North Korea, by the way, on both sides. Deployments, exercises, rehearsals of armed conflict. I don't know whether either side is serious about carrying out those threats. I do know that if one does, the other is almost sure is not going to back down. I don't think so. But it could be that neither will actually let this come to armed conflict. That's a possibility. I would say more likely uh, something will come about in the next 12 months, maybe not right away with the North and South getting together in the next month or so uh, during the Olympics, and it's possible that they will cool things down. But will Kim Jong-un totally stop testing either missiles or I wish, or warheads? I, I wish I were confident of that. I wish he wouldn't do it uh, because I'm afraid that will lead to war. But uh, I'm afraid that it's more likely than not that in the course of the next 12 months, he will decide to do that to improve his deterrence. And it will be a mistake, because rather than deterring attack, it will provoke attack. And once he's attacked, I think the response by the North Koreans, even if Kim Jong-un is killed in the first stages, the response will still be there. It will be not par- it will not paralyze them any more than it would paralyze the U.S. or Russia to hit our capital cities. Uh, our, we have plans, as Eisenhower made, and it's always been done, we have plans for retaliation despite the uh, killing, the massacre of all of our top decision makers. I'm sure that's true in North Korea as well. So we could be very close as we were in Cuba. Coming back to Cuba, despite their intentions in that case, where they were determined not to go to armed conflict, I, I would like that to be the case now, and I don't know if it is, but then it was, and yet they came within a hair's breadth of armed conflict, and I don't think either of them could have managed to draw back from that once it got started. If it got started then, you and I would not be talking here. There wouldn't be an alert in Hawaii. It would all be gone, because our attacks on the Soviet Union then would have burned enough cities to cause nuclear winter, to, as would happen now if we got into a nuclear war with Russia. Uh, the firestorms caused by our nuclear attacks on cities would loft hundreds of millions of tons of smoke and toxic black soot into the stratosphere where it wouldn't rain out and where it would stay, go even higher under the warmth of the sun, and it would stay for more than a decade, lowering temperatures on this earth with 70% of the sunlight captured and not, not getting to the earth's surface, Lowering temperatures to winter-like conditions all year, killing all harvests, and starving nearly everyone to death within a year or so. Some would go faster uh, because our exports from the U.S. would stop right away and from China would stop. Uh, They would go sooner, but we would go later unless we'd saved up an immense amount of decades and more worth of food, which we certainly trying to do, and and moreover, uh, not many Americans or Russians would be left anyway, thanks to the immediate effects. But the other countries would starve. So that's what's at stake in a U.S.-Russian attack, and that's why I say that each of them has a doomsday machine, a system capable of ending most life on Earth. Probably not all, not total extinction, just near extinction, and there's no just on that, of course, Ironic, an ironic term, but uh, maybe one percent would live, and that's seventy million people mm. uh, in Australia and New Zealand uh, eating fish and mollusks from the sea, and uh, maybe not, but uh, probably some humans would live. Most other large animals, larger than a squirrel or so, would suffer the fate they did when an asteroid blocked out sunlight with dust particles 67 million years ago, and the dinosaurs all died. We've all heard that the dinosaurs died after millions and millions of years of dominating the Earth. We haven't mostly heard that every animal larger than a raccoon or a squirrel died. Well, that's what happened now. We could do that now. It would be a man-made, I think you could 
it's a human-made, but pretty much man-made asteroid okay. in its effect. And that's what that's what we're maintaining in office. That's what Obama scheduled to rebuild, and and uh, uh, Putin is rebuilding, and Trump is building even larger and bigger and greater. This capacity, a, a greater doomsday machine than we've ever had. I've I've read that you were particularly um, upset about Lindsey Graham's comments that uh, if there was some type of confrontation uh, with the North Koreans, that it would ha- that it would be isolated over there. And um, it so happens that that's not a totally unfamiliar comment to me, because going fifty years back to 1961, it was already the case that in this war. Uh, that we ourselves might launch and preemptively in the fear that uh, the Russians were about to attack us, a mistaken belief, or the not mistaken belief that we were getting in an armed conflict over Berlin or somewhere, and that we it was time for us to exercise our war plans. In those days, we were already writing off Western Europe as being over there. They really were hardly taken into calculations. It's hard to find a calculation of how many Western Europeans would die. That's why the diagram and the, the account that I give in the prologue to my book is actually a still secret, essentially. It was top secret then. The government has never officially released what's in the diagram and the discussion I have in the first few pages of my book. I'm asserting that that was the estimate in 1961, and no one has ever published. People have said several hundred million would die, but no, uh, when they retire, like Herb York and others. But nobody has actually purported to uh, quote an actual document, which is what I do. And I, and I should say, if, uh, if Trump wanted to, if Trump wanted to indict me for that, by the way, I think under current standards he could get me. Right. I don't think that's ever been declassified. Interesting. And and we should say that the invasion and occupation of Iraq was, you know, uh, in many respects, a miscalculation by Saddam Hussein that if he pretended he had those weapons of mass destruction, uh, perhaps maybe uh, the, the Bush administration wouldn't come. Pardon me, explain that to me a little bit. How well, was that a miscalculation by Saddam Hussein? Well, uh, I, I can think of an answer to that, but what's your answer? Well, my sense is is that he thought that that would prevent an attack. Um, and that was the, and I don't know if there was huh? actually an ability to prevent an attack. Um, You're talking about the U.S., aren't you? The U.S. was talking about hitting WMDs, which turned out not to exist exactly. any more than the Soviet ICBMs. Absolutely. It wasn't a mistake by Saddam. It, uh, the mistake that Kim Jong-un thinks Saddam made was not, not having them. WMDs. Yes, indeed, indeed, and certainly, um, you know, uh, the example of Gaddafi um, is is uh, yeah. support for that. It's very much in uh, Kim Jong Un's mind that Gaddafi and and Saddam chose not to have WMDs and they got attacked. Right. Uh, a problem currently is uh, this: Kim Jong Un does have WMDs. Yes. And he may very well be on the verge of being attacked. So the idea that it's a thorough uh, protection and deterrent is uh, not very not very reliable, it looks at this moment. Um, you wrote, while you were at Harvard, uh, the a paper on the political use of madness. In your book, you um, suggest that, that the, the, the madman theory may have developed almost parallel to your thinking of it, that it was maybe just in the air at that time. But wh- tell us a little bit about that theory and how much you think it still may be operative. Because there's time where Trump sort of sort of projects that that's what's going on here. Like, I'm going to be the madman. I, I think it's been really characteristic of our policy, more or less conscious, uh, from the very beginning. Uh, as early as Eisenhower, who definitely chose to be very ambiguous, he used that word even, in his press conference as to whether he would or would not use nuclear weapons. Dulles definitely relied on that. Don't make them sure. And sometimes he talked about the need to make people sure that you're going to retaliate. But other times he said, no, the important thing is their uncertainty. That's going back to Dulles when Nixon was vice president. Nixon, uh, really the same 
theory was used by Nixon when he was president. He called it the madman theory. But he didn't invent it. Uh, the truth is, he, he referred to Eisenhower in that connection. And uh, ever since then, we have a myriad of examples of different officials talking in precisely those terms, that we have to keep the other side uncertain. We can't say no first use, no, we will never initiate nuclear war, because that would make them too certain. It would make them too aggressive. They, we want them to be more careful and to not be sure what will happen if we do. Of course, the trouble with that is that to make that threat even ambiguous, credible, we build up a doomsday machine. Uh, we didn't have to do that, but we did do it, and we maintain it, and the Russians do the same. And indeed, Kim Jong-un is going now for a better deterrent than he already has. He wants to have an H-bomb and an ICBM uh, going beyond the medium-range missiles that he already has and the A-bombs, the fission weapons he has. Well, he thinks it will give him more deterrence, and it might give him more deterrence. But that's at the very obvious price of possibly provoking the U.S. to attack him, to preempt him. So he's taking a gamble, which is pretty much the same kind of gamble that the U.S. and NATO and the Russians have relied on for half a century. And it's absolutely unjustifiable. It's a, it's a gamble that could work. It hasn't, it hasn't led to our annihilation yet. But that's uh, about as reassuring as the fact that uh, New Orleans still existed in the year 2000. Uh, it was urgent for them to improve their levees then and strengthen their levees and heighten them, uh, even though there had not been a Category 3 or 5 hurricane the year before or the year after. And they didn't do it. And eventually, New Orleans went under. Well, we're talking about something now, a catastrophe of a million times greater. Is is there, and, and you outlined some, some, some short-term proposals in your book, um, could, I mean, what, is it, is, um, do we need a, a sort of um, a, a cultural or a sort of a, uh, a psychological change to be able to, to, to do this, to, to sort of like... You're asking, you're asking good questions there. You're, you're picking them out uh, between the lines of what I'm saying there. I'm saying, yes, we really need to change our attitudes and are, in a, in a national sense, in the attitudes that have currency, that get people elected, or that keep them from being unelected. Um, there has to be a, a very massive change in this country. As great as the change that occurred in the USSR when the Berlin Wall came down, when Gorbachev led the way as a leader in uh, giving up the idea of of uh, controlling East Europe, uh, the Soviet Empire determining the, re the regimes of those countries and changing them when they weren't in Moscow's interest. Well. Uh, Putin right now thinks that was the greatest mistake there ever was, practically, for yeah. Gorbachev to do that. I'm sure that Putin does not think about restoring the whole Warsaw Pact now, which most, and nearly all of which is in inside NATO at this point. But he is trying to establish uh, that he's a great power again, which means that at least his own little empire next to the borders of the Soviet Union, and if not Poland, at least Western Ukraine, Eastern Ukraine and Georgia and so forth, they're under Soviet, or I should say Russian influence, the way that we still think that Honduras or Panama is for us to uh, decide how they run. Uh, we're not on the verge of uh, uh, we're not on the verge of invading Mexico, for example. Uh, and yet, is <laughs> if Mexico went too far in a direction against U.S. interests, if we saw, would Mexico be uh, quite free from American intervention? No, right. I don't think so. And uh, and Putin wants to have the same kind of uh, influence on what he calls his near abroad. Okay, well. Unless that changes back to what Gorbachev was talking about, back to a world in which we talk about cooperative security, not security at the cost of our neighbors or our, our rivals' security, but, secu but uh, cooperative security, finding it in mutual decisions 
for example, the security of the entire world and our human species would be enormously improved if the U.S. got rid of its lightning rods for attack, its intercontinental ballistic missiles, or Russia did, or better, both did. That would be good for the world and would be good for us. Uh, it would be worth billions of dollars to dismantle those weapons. They're dangerous. They make us all less safe, as uh, people just experienced in Hawaii. What just happened in Hawaii in this uh, false alarm was that a million people were made aware of being in a situation in which the whole world has been engulfed for the last half century without being aware of it, in, in a kind of sleepwalking. And that is of having our existence, their existence, contingent on somebody's behavior half the world away, uh, on the absence of a human error, on the absence of an electronic error. Uh, our, we're, we're living on that sufferance as a kind of hostage. Kennedy called it living under a sword of Damocles, the sword that was over a ruler's uh, chair suspended by a single hair. But uh, Kennedy and Kennedy called for changing that situation, but he didn't. He made the hair thinner. He made the uh, the sword heavier by an enormous amount, actually. So did Reagan. So did uh, Brezhnev, etc. Uh, that that sword of Damocles is is there to this day, and the Hawaiian people, a million of them, were just told that the hair had been cut. The sword was coming down. Fortunately, it was a false alarm, but the sword exists, and it threatens everybody on Earth. That shouldn't be the situation. Uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's intolerable. It's unjustifiable. It's immoral. It's scandalous. It's horrible. It's dangerous. You know, what words can be used? And yet, it's persisting. And, and one reason it's persisting, by the way, is that keeping it in operation talk of a sword in operation exactly, but embellishing that sword is profitable on both right. sides. On the Russia, I don't know, what, I can't quite put it in exactly the same terms as, as uh, North Korea, that's in the one of the few countries in the world left that's like the old Soviet Union, but in Russia, they have the same motives for building up these weapons that we do, profit, even votes. I don't know how much you relies on votes, but over here, our legislators depend on votes, campaign contributions. Our military uh, depends on promotions and the size of the forces and the budget and on getting very well-paying jobs in the military-industrial complex when they retire. And all these motives are enough to keep the sword of Damocles over our heads. In the event that we were to be able to evolve to the point as a, as a body politic, to understand the idea that... Um, that there at the end of the day, as it were, creating security by um, developing security by creating a sense of insecurity in other players in this um, in the world is not the way to go. But rather by it's saying the way humanity has gone for so long, indeed. And, and Gorbachev had a real insight there, helped by such people as George A. Arbatov and other people, in what he called a new way of thinking. And it was indeed a new way of thinking. It was the kind, in a way, it exemplified what Einstein was calling for when he said in 1946, the unleashed power of the atom has changed everything, save our modes of thinking. And thus, we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. Unfortunately, he didn't define for us just at that point what was it in our thinking that had to change? He, didn't, he did, in the rest of his life, say a lot about that. He was a pacifist, yeah, except in World War II. And he was the head of the War Resisters League, conscientious objectors, and so forth. And he said quite a bit about that. But on that occasion, the nuclear age, he didn't spell it out. Well, Gorbachev did spell it out quite well 40 years later. Uh, and he talked about the new way of thinking, which was, as I said, cooperative security, where you improve the security of both yourself and others by improving their security as well and not threatening them, not intimidating them. What Trump is saying now 
is what really every president has felt he, he or she had to say, it's been all he so far, had to say to get elected and to stay elected. And that is, we've got to keep these other people on edge, uncertain, insecure, worried about what we may do. And we ignore the fact that uh, we ignore the fact that that makes them <laughs> indeed insecure. They build up their weapons for deterrence uh, in order to even the balance and make us less secure. And nowadays, uh, with cold, with the socialist union uh, over, both sides find that profitable. Right. Uh, money is made. Jobs are made by uh, by rebuilding the doomsday machine. That has to change. And how how will it change? Well, I think if, if uh, maybe Hawaii will help. Maybe Trump will help. He's brought it home to us how dangerous this situation is. I mean, a lot of people are able to say, we don't like to live in a world where the entire existence of humanity depends on the whim of Donald Trump. But the next step is to say, and which human do you should want to it, trust? Right with the doomsday machine. There's never been a human who, is, who should be trusted with such a machine. Now, no president, not Abraham Lincoln, not George Washington, uh, should not be given a doomsday machine uh, with the, uh, and, uh, and tempted to use it in his diplomatic relationships and to keep elected. Daniel Ellsberg, the book is The Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. Thank you so much for coming on. It, it really a genuine honor to speak to you. Well, thank you. Very good questions, and it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice is Option where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive. 